It's a great pleasure to welcome you here tonight, both in person and online in the ether, um, to a reading and conversation with Shu Dipsen about his new book, Anthropocene, Climate Change, Contagion and Consolation. So the running order is that um, after a very brief uh, introduction by myself, um, Shadeep is going to read from the book. Um, there's going to be a couple of short films um, and then we'll open up the discussion on uh, literary and artistic um, responses to global catastrophe. So our speaker tonight, um, Shudeep Sen, has published more than a dozen critically acclaimed collections of poetry. He's also a translator and a photographer. And his interest and immersion in a variety of creative expression can be seen in, I think, all of his published work. And it's also reflected in Anthropocene's hybrid form, where the grief and the disruption of climate change is also accompanied by passionate responses to art, music, dance, and the sensual world. As we know, uh, climate change provided the conditions for the coronavirus contagion, but it also acted as a kind of catalyst for a long overdue global reckoning with the ways in which mankind has engineered the circumstances of its own destruction. In Anthropocene, we see a poet of the global South bearing witness to the isolations and the specific horrors of the past two years of the global pandemic, but also to the interconnections of places and peoples and poets, while offering solace instead of pessimism. So Shadeep, I will hand it over to you now. So good evening, everybody. It's lovely to see you. And um, it's good that some friends have made a long trip, some from Nottingham, some from Delhi, especially for this, clearly not. Uh, but uh, I, I believe it's snowing outside. So it's, it's especially nice that you've you know, sort of come. It's, um, I've been in the UK now for almost two and a half months around you know, doing events around this book. And um, officially, it's my last day in Cambridge, so it's really lovely to end it here. Thank you, Julian, for inviting me. Georgia, for all the fabulous work you've done. And Rebecca, thank you very, very much for reading it so closely, and then we'll have a chat. Um, so let me just start with um, the book itself. I'll be reading a few poems from the book. And the very first poem is called Disembodied. And it's located in my home city of Delhi, and uh, the issues explored here are fairly universal, as you will realize. But one of the big problems of Delhi is also, in addition to uh, um, climate change, we also have had a, a long history of pollution because of various reasons. So part of that comes in. And, and if you're an asthmatic, um, that time, especially winters in Delhi, is not a particularly pleasant place to be. So that's part of this. Disembodied. My body carved from abandoned bricks of a ruined temple, from minaret shards of an old mosque, from slate remnants of a medieval church apse, from soil tilled by my ancestors. My bones don't fit together correctly as they should. The searing ultraviolet light from Aurora Borealis patches and etch corrects my orientation. Magnetic pulses prove potent. My flesh sculpted from the fruits of the tropics, blood from coconut water, skin colored by brown bark of Indian teak, my lungs fueled by Delhi's insidious toxic air echo asthmatic sounds, a new vinyl dub remix. Our universe where radiation germinates from human follies, where contamination persists from mistrust, where pleasures of sex are merely a sport, where everything is ambition, everything is desire, Everything is nothing, nothing and everything. White light everywhere, 
but no one can recognize its hue. No one knows that there is color in it, all possible colors. Body worshiped not for its blessings, but its contour, artificial shape shaped by Nautilus, skin moistened by L'Oreal and not by season's first rains, skeleton strength not shaped by earthquakes or slow molded by fearless forest fires. Ice caps are rapidly melting, too fast to arrest glacial slide. In the near future, there will be in the near future, there will be no water left or too much water that is undrinkable, excess water that will drown us all. This embodied floats, a float like Noah's Ark, no GPS, no pole star navigation, no fossil fuel to burn away, just maps with empty grids and names of places that might exist. Already, there's too much traffic on the road. Unpeopled hollow metal shells without brakes swerve about, directionless, looking for an elusive compass. The next one is called um, Obituary. And I wrote this um, partly out of a visual response to um, these two front pages of New York Times. This was just after the first um, wave. And one day the New York Times just had just a blackened out first page with the masthead on top. And another day, they had just the names of the people, just the people who had died during the first part of the first wave. I mean, graphically, you can't but not respond to something like this. But of course, you know, there was all sorts of other things happening, uh, George Floyd and so on and so forth. Uh, it opens with an epigraph, which is basically a quotation directly from the New York Times of that of the second paper, and I quote: "They were simply not; they were not simply names on a list. They were us. Death knell peel, numbers multiply." Ra virus ravages us one by one. Newspaper columns loom on steady ghostly apparitions on broadsheets, name, age, date of death. Tall epitaphs in fine print. Ink spills, bleeds dark. Newsprint blotting out a wheezing breath. No amount of hygiene ritual enables our lungs to resuscitate our lives, micropoint sites, fonts on an ever inflating pandemic list. Black specks, fugitive lonely numbers, the deceased on an official roster. Another sick, another dying, another dead. Yes, they were us. The next one again takes its inspiration from an image. Uh, the other side of my life is as a photographer. And um, this is the image. If you, it's difficult to see it from here, of course, when you see it closely, it is kind of a black canvas with the hint of a broken cross, the crucifix. What actually happened was it was uh, late at night and um, I went to the bathroom and when I came out, I didn't shut the door quite right and forgot to turn the lights off. And the lights coming from the bathroom into the uh, uh, bedroom formed this beautiful little image. And um, that's partly what prompted it. The rest of it is fairly evident in the poem. 
Uh, it's called Hope Light Leaks. And it's very important actually for me that the book predominantly ends in hope because without light, without hope, there's just no way to carry on. And, and it's an important aspect that has to be emphasized even though times are grim, they are dark, uh, politics are toxic, it's too right-wing oriented and the rest of it. Hope, light leaks, and it has an epigraph from Martin Luther King Jr. And I quote, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Late at night, light leaks, spilling beyond the door's rectangle edge. A cleaving schism, its shape, a partial crucifix, a new resurrection. Light's plane waxes, wanes, viral load expands, contracts. Photons spill, conduction sparks. Light slow removes, cataracts veil. In this blackness, lives matter. So the book is not about all doom and gloom. There's a lot of smiles in the book as well. And the very first poem is called, That Is, uh, titled I dot E dot. I read this poem out now, and when we have the three films that are shown, uh, you'll see a rendition, uh, uh, an American uh, songwriter and musician. She's um, used a lot of the poems from this new book and has made a whole album of songs based on the poems. And you'll see what she does later. But this is a short little poem that opens the book, and it's for my son, Aria. And I sent it to him, and um, of course, he said, oh, no, Dad, one more poem to comment on. Um, and he said, well, Baba, it's actually really beautiful, but I have no idea what it means. So I said, at least you find the aesthetics of beauty in it, and that's, that's good enough. And um, so here is the poem. That is for Arya. That is because you hear the sound of a lone rustling leaf. You hear the sea. That is because I consider the sea silent. You hear its silence in my studio. That is, and because of that, the silence will not empty the sea of its leaves. This is a poem titled Language. And of course, without language, we can't do the stuff we're doing. But also it's a comment on the wider framework of what's happening in the world, historically, socially, and, and otherwise. Language has become so politicized, it's being misused, fake news, um, cancel culture, all sorts of things uh, which are destroying the real essence of language itself. But the reason I wrote the poem is because it's something that excites me. You know, when you string words together and it makes a pitch perfect sound, it's such a thrill at a personal level when you're a creative artist. Um, also, it's, the, it's an ode to my first typewriter, which I bought when I was young. I think I was in high school and I'd saved some money and bought this sort of um, little thing. And it still works, it's still there. But the problem with this is it's more expensive and very difficult to source the silk, red, and uh, um, black ribbons, uh, sadly. But the, just the tactility of a typewriter is wonderful. Language. And it opens with an epigraph from Italo Calvino, and I quote, without translation, I would be limited to the borders of my own country. The translator 
is my most important ally. My typewriter is multilingual, its keys mysteriously calibrating my bipolar forked tongue. Black red silk ribbon spools unwind as the carriage moves right to left. In cursive hand, I write from left to right. My tongue was born promiscuous, speaking in many languages. My heart spoke another, my head yet another. The translation seamless. Oracles, ventricles pump blood. Capuscle-like alphabets, phrases, syntax, cross-fertilize my text, breathing life. Texture enriched, music, cadence spatially enhanced, osmotic, polyglottal, a polygamy of grammar. Letter forms, dance, ligatures, pirouette, ascenders, descenders, pitch perfect. Imagination isn't caged in speech. Speech cannot be caged in language. Thank you. My God, that's very generous. <laughs> this sort of thing in England is unusual because maybe in India you have a lot of hurrah after every poem, but here it's the sort of monastic poise which people have. You don't know whether it's working or it's not working. <laughs> that's good. Thank you. <laughs> Um, since someone clapped, maybe I find injecting humor in poetry really, really, really difficult. Uh, uh, my poems tend to be fairly serious, often overly somber, sometimes painfully, painfully depressing. Um, um, unless they're, of course, love poems, then depending on the phase of one's life, it could be very happy. But mostly, it's a reflection of what may or may not happen. So they tend to be kind of very serious. So I'm going to read this poem, which I wrote for fun. Uh, but then it fits into this whole schemata of where we are. It's called Preparing for a Perfect Death. And I thought it was a very funny thing to look forward to, a very humorous thing to do. It has a quote, a translation of a quote from a Pakistani poet. His name is Iftikar Arif. And my translator, translation of uh, the couplet I chose to uh, put as an epigraph uh, is, I want to be shattered like a dream, such a loneliness that wants to die. Get your papers in order, choose your inheritors fairly with love, care. Outline clearly who gets what, what they are required to execute. Execution after your execution, their inheritance, your legacy. Thereafter, the phase of reflection, hold all you wish to for one last time. Forgive those who have wronged you, smile, hug, and give gratitude. Record everything in minute details. Leave no unresolved business or debts. Donate your organs, give to the needy. We are on the side of being generous. Then the most difficult part, how and where to die, what to wear. Be tidy and smartly turned out. There's no room for sh shabbiness here. Of course, one would like it to be swift and painless without any show. An elegant private ceremony for one. A dream end. A perfect Thank you.
Um, this one is called Driftwood. I wrote it, um, this is a pre-pandemic poem, but you know, now the way, the, the way we sort of uh, divide geographical time and so on is pre-pandemic or I'm a COVID virgin, strange things we say these days. Oh, I'm boosted, not quite, but single vaxxed and so on. So this one is written in St. Lucia. It's dedicated to one of my uh, mentors, De uh, Derek Walcott, who won the Nobel Prize in 19, um, 1992. And, and I saw part of the house in, in St. Lucia, of course, you know, there's a huge erosion if you're living in any coastal countries, the, the sea erosion on, on, on wood and other other organic materials is very, very harsh and swift, and you can see that in front of your eyes. So that's the context of the poem, partly. Partly, of course, it's about climate change as, uh, as we see it. And it's something that I've been thinking about for many, many, many years. Uh, it's not, the book wasn't written because of the situation we are in. Oddly, one has to say that during the pandemic, the, the book was a gift of the pandemic. It sounds ironic, really, because how can anything in the pandemic be a gift? But in a sense, it gave you, gave you so much time and uh, scope for reflection and time to read. So this is called Driftwood. And uh, I use Derek Walcott's um, line from Archipelago, Map of the New World. And um, I quote says, at the end of the sentence, rain will begin. I mean, just the ferocity and confidence of a person who's writing poetry, and this is way before he won the Nobel Prize, he was known. At the end of the sentence, rain will begin. The sort of Caribbean, Gaelic, cry that you can sort of summon the nature and things will happen and things do happen. We had in our own, my culture, you know, you could, you have rags, which uh, if you sing it, you know, you get rainfall and so on. Driftwood. Part of the banister railing is absent in spite of its strong metal rivet moorings. Termite eaten, consumed by the sea. I can see its woody skeleton float far away among the surf, its salt scarred coat tossing and struggling to keep afloat against the waves' incessant lashing. There is music in its disappearance, a buoyant symphony, note strokes resurrecting life, a new story history restored by resilient fingers of a master artist. Wheelchair and weak legs are inconsequential impediments. His mind sparking with electric edge, whiplash wit at its most acerbic. There is generosity for family, friends, those who are gone and remain and 30 new poems, an intricate magic of ekphrastic love. In the front garden facing the same sea with Pigeon Island on the horizon's left, lies a cluster of wind-eroded oval rocks. Their shapes mimic a lost egret's nest or a ballerina's curved arch a stone memorial for a close friend. The driftwood is now out of sight, part of the house donated to the sea. In gratitude, the sea sings a raucous song. Folded cumulonimbus clouds echo in synchronicity, a soundscape absorbing his commandment at the end of the sentence, rain will begin. Read two more poems. Um, this was the poem I wrote 
Um, the Indian Express newspaper in India, um, uh, it's a very good newspaper and has a very, very good editorial and op-ed op page. And uh, the editor asked me to write something, you know, when the corona started and, and what he probably expected was, you know, I mean, he was expecting a nonfiction piece, uh, tightly written and so on and so forth in, in prose. And, and I wrote this poem and I said, listen, he's not gonna publish it because the newspaper doesn't publish poetry and you know, they've never published poetry. Anyway, I sent it to him and he ran it. And then the most astonishing thing happened because it was so early on during the pandemic that this poem got picked up by media, has been translated to, to over 30 languages. Um, and um, strange things happen. And this is called Love in the Time of Corona. Of course, it's a doff to Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Um, and I quote a line from Love in the Time of Cholera. I don't believe in God, but I'm afraid of him. And there's another quote, which is of course, very, very famous, Brex. In the dark times, Will there also be singing? Yes, there will also be singing about the dark times. Faint indigo tints and the grays of your hair evoke memory. Krishna's love for Radha, its perennial longevity, its sustained mythology, its blue bathed law, such a life's enduring parallels. 14 years, yet my heart flutters, infatuated like first love. My hands fidgety, palms sweaty, pulse too fast to pick. I'm not allowed to touch your face. Cyber flurry emoji love cannot assuage fears or Corona's comatose cries. I don't believe in God. In thousands, migrant workers march home, hungry footsteps on empty highways accentuate an irony. Social distancing, a privilege only powerful can afford. Cretans pray bleach on unprotected poor, clap, bang plates, ring bells, blow conches, light fires to rid the voodoo. Corona's karma infected. Mood swings in sanitized quarantine, self-isolation impose, uncontained virus, viral. When shall we sing our dreams epiphanies? City weather fluctuates, promiscuously mapping temperatures by polar graph. Tropics air conditioner chill, winters unseasonal hailstorm, skies, pink, blue, spring. Blue, gray will molt into salt and pepper, ash gray to silver white, and then to aged white. My lungs heave, slow grating metallic crackles struggle to escape the filigreed windpipes. I persist in my prayers. I'm afraid of him. Hope, heed, heal our song in present tense. And I'll end the reading um, with this poem uh, called Om a ceremony. Om, the word Om is often misspelled in the West as A-U-N. Um, Om is the first syllabic sound, uh, a single syllabic sound, which is the, the birth sound, the first sound of the cosmos. Um, and that sort of, you know, is an echo for the civilizational, it's a civilizational sound really. 
Uh, but the poem is really uh, partly a comment on what is happening in many parts of the world, but particularly what's happening in my country, in India, in Delhi, where during the first phase of the pandemic, we ran out of uh, burial grounds uh, um, and you know, bodies were being burnt in parking lots on the sides of the streets. I've never seen anything like this. I've heard stories from my grandparents and so on, what happened in the partition, but they're just stories. They're just stuff I've read in the books, films I've seen, but this is the closest possibly I could have ever seen something. And you know, you're helpless, you can do nothing. And uh, amid all this, uh, Prime Minister's uh, raising the middle of Delhi and building this Disneyland sort of uh, space to propagate his, I don't know what. Um, I'm constantly trolled. Uh, I'm, I'm surprised my head has not been chopped off yet, but I will still read this because it's part of dissent, it's part of the truth, and it's important for all of us to hear this. Om, a sermant, and it has a little epigraph from Gethe, architecture of frozen music. Uh, I must also say that it references a wonderful, wonderful Indian poet, Aga Shahid Ali, who was Kashmiri. And uh, there are two lines which I quote within the poem, but you'll recognize that. In my city, I'm surrounded by constant cries of the dying, burning pyres heaving under burden of wood, smoke, and bones, wailing summed up by sonic notes of Aum. Civilization's first sound, Sanskrit syllable echoing a conch shell's harmonic mapping, its involute spiral geometry holding within and emanating airborne sonar screens. My ancestors, grandmothers, mother, blew into the smooth shell, cupped in their palms, held intimately, as if it were a talisman, a prayer, a pranayam in yoga's daily ritual. But breathing is such a privilege these days. Pandemic struck, oxygen deprived, my friends perish, the country buckles airless. Even an exquisite sediment lacks the sheen or wax to wrap the contours of a corpse now. Each day as I write endless condolence notes, etching dirge-like couplets on gravestones, my city continues to be dug up, not to make space for burial sites, but for palaces of illusion, an architecture of frozen music, greed, calumny. A country without a government, a country without a post office, Shahid laments. Let me cry out in that void, say it as I can. I write on that void. Own celebration now and unceasing requiem. Yet we chant in hope for peace. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Thank you. Now we'll see uh, the poem that is that's been made into a song. I'm just going to play one one of them because I think my now my friend who I haven't met, uh, who lives in Oregon, uh, she's has the, the 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 CD has been released. It's on Spotify and other uh, platforms. And uh, the second film is called Silence. It's a film that's made by a, a Calcutta filmmaker. She took three of my poems and made it into a poetry film. And the last one is called Prayer Flag. Um, 
And uh, it's, uh, it's set in the high Himalayas. Um, I've done a lot of trekking and walking in, in that part of the world. And it's set in Man Manasarovar, which is the lake which births the big rivers of India, Ganga especially. And uh, you'll see the references there. But what really happened was I do a lot of collaborations with musicians and dancers. And there's a dancer, one of the doins of Kathak dance um, in India called Shovna Narayan. And she did this big production called Shunneta, which means nothingness or everything, uh, void. And she said, you know, I'd like to use this poem as part of my production. So what she did was she had the poem translated, read out, and there were 50 actual monks on the stage saying, oh, that's mesmeric, really. So, and she got me to read the poem, and that's the prologue to the uh, production. And then she says, you know, why don't we make a little film because, you know, the, uh, the poem, you know, the production travels to various places. So I said, aren't I travel everywhere with you, you know? I mean, you know, but of course it's not practical. So there was this little film that was made, which opens the production uh, when I'm not there. Just enjoy it. We'll both will sit there. We can watch the film and then we'll come back again. Mm -hmm. 
after a long concert and after dinner, I find myself unexpectedly with you in my room. In this new space, finding oneself is wonderful. I was here and not here at the same time. Later, I felt as if I had entered a story of an old familiar novel, a character I knew but had not met in flesh until now. Mattress is the wide ocean, the crushed sheets, the waves. We sail together full blown. But during your long absences, as our ships are docked on different shores, sometimes the bed dreams. I imagine the wet breaking the anchor loose, defying gravity, current, and electricity as photons propel and burn even the wild salted expanse into a monument, a desire, permanent like the ocean bed its pulses uncontrollably rocking. The waters, the bodies, the dreams. Silence has its own subtle color between each breath pause, heat simmers latent saliva, tongue entwined lisp. Here and there, errant clouds wait, yearning for rain, desire melting even silence to words. Words color bleed incarnadine as your lips whisper softly the secrets of your silence. Your fine chicken blouse, white, sheer, and almost transparent, cannot hide the quiet of your heartbeat on your wheat olive skin. The milk white flower adorning your hair sheds a solitary petal, just one in that petal, silence blooms color, white, transparent white. Pure white silence.
Flapping in the high winds, prayer flags gently unravel. Homage to the day's first light. But today the dawn is not as bright, though heavy, brooding, silver gray like the lake's shimmering glass top. No one is here except for a woman staring far away, wrapped in her sanctity of continuous linen, her own sari like a prayer flag, though devoid of any color. She isn't mourning or crying, just gazing fixedly into the water's changing glimmer as the sky's wet weight and the shore's rocky line meet, their edges meanderingly melting into the lake itself. I stood far behind her, behind everything she saw. She was only an accidental figure in the widescreen frame. Unlike her, I was looking skywards through the prayer flag's translucent cotton, counting each thread of each piece of cloth that wove private stories whispered only to me. Weather-worn, strung across canted multiple horizons, I tried to map their own geographies, each an island, each with its own terrain, texture, inscription, and scripture. Found on the highest points on land, as close to the sky as is possible, these magic carpets, shapes caught on an unintentional clothesline, were more meaningful to me than this vast monastic scenery. How each flag, each one must have preserved secrets that only their owners knew. How each a talisman exuded safety and calm, shrouding away grief for the briefest while, when one forgets everything, real, imagined, and just dreams. My own piece of cloth that I once tied onto this line wasn't visible to me now. But that did not matter. I found strength in this procession of private passion, in these flags' lack of starch or hierarchy. Their story is passed down by one flag to another, toggled hand in hand through time and age, just like my pet yellow butterfly who infused each flower in my garden with the gift of life without any show or fair. I like the transparent quiet here. I also like the wind's occasional sound, its severe current tearing through the flag's heart, 
picking out the perfect pitch and melody. A memory now, a still, framed, not revealing to the world what I had once seen. The panorama's generosity, its wild, stark untouchability, how each story stitched and preserved like the jewel in the lotus, its crystal fine edges caressed by petal soft skin until everything falls inward like a fetus in a womb, a toppled, misplaced comma, my own implanted memory. And then they bloom, fanning outward, each flag, strand, story, each private grief and pleasure, chanting noiselessly in the mountain's silent winds. Um, hopefully, it's my mic on. Maybe almost. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Thanks so much for I think a kind of really good sample of of what your um, work is interested in and the variety and in interpenetration of of visual art, um, music, and dance. And again, that's that kind of very lyric sensibility. Um, I want to kind of ask you slightly um, a kind of point, pointed question. So. Um, in his book, uh, The Great Derangement, Amitav Ghosh talks about how the contemporary novel is, is no good for representing climate change, right? Mm -hmm. Because it works with individual lifespans and it, it's, it, it's, not, it's complicit in climate change. And I'm wondering, do you think, I'm not, I'm not assuming that you think this, but do you think that poetry is better equipped for dealing with what we're facing in the Anthropocene? You know, I don't think it's a question of genre more than intent. Um, it is true that novelists haven't really dealt with it in the way it should have been dealt. Um, I mean, I think I remember reading an interview by, um, uh, with Amitabh Ghosh a while ago where he says that, you know, writers are not taking these issues head on. Mm -hmm. But actually, poets have all done it for the longest time. Um, it's what happens is with poetry, there may be one or two poems that are written by a poet who, and they deal with that particular subject. But as a sustained book, it's perhaps not happened. And this is probably the first time as a poetry book that you have something that you know, is dealing with issues of climate change, pandemic and all that. Um, it's also, I think it's a problematic thing. By the way, The Great Derangement is a book I really, really enjoyed. Uh, his new sequel to that book, The Nutmeg's Curse, has just come out, and I would recommend that you read it. Uh, that um, book moved me in, in ways that made me very uncomfortable, but in, uncomfortable in a good way. But with, you know, with, with poetry, um, the form is so exact. Mm. It's shorter, unless you're writing uh, an epic. Um, that you can do a lot more within a small space. I mean, mind you, you know, if you take a books like um, Milton's Paradise Lost and uh, Paradise Regained, you can uh, overlay issues of climate change and global destruct uh, destructions even in those in those books. So it's been done for forever. It's just that people are not used to seeing this in a way that is perhaps uh, apparent to writers and creative artists. So, so you, you mentioned his, his most recent book, The, the Nutmeg Crisis, right? Um, Curse. Curse, yeah, sorry. Crisis on the mind. Um, it, that's another non-fiction book, yeah. right? Um, and and I'm, I'm interested in the way in which Anthropocene, your, your work, deals with and, and incorporates, you mentioned the New York Times page, but, but the materials of non-fiction are really crucial yeah. to, to how you're writing. And I'm, again, another kind of polemical question. Is it possible to write poetry without the materials of science and nonfiction now? 
post pandemic and in the Anthropocene. Like what what's what's the lyric I got to do with it? Is what I might say. The lyric I has got everything to do with it actually. Without the lyric I, both I as in the letter I or I Y E, you can't make images. Uh, and images are crucial to any construction of poetry. Uh, images are crucial to any kind of visual art form, whether it's uh, art or photography or filmmaking. And uh, the way you control light and the aspect ratio, uh, some of the films are shot at four by three aspect ratio, some, some use 16 by nine, um, some use a square format. All those things are very, very important because uh, each constructional element of any art, be it poetry or any art form you choose, is very important because uh, it drives the reader as well as the viewer towards a certain kind of polemic. Mm. And the better art, the better pieces of writing, the better poetry is done subtly. Mm. So that is the hard part, how you do it how you construct it and deconstruct it and then get all the isms and jargon out mm -hmm. and make it not just intelligible, not make it less complex, but use the lyric eye in a way that actually touches both the head and the heart. You know, the calibration is very, very important. It's like, you know, if you're in a uh, sound mixing studio, you have this thousand buttons in front of you. And uh, you know, part of it controls the treble, the bass, and the mid-range. And it's up to the singer or the composer or the writer to calibrate in a certain it in a certain way so that he or she can then bring out the best in what he or she is trying to say. So those constructional elements, the architectural elements become very, very crucial. And nonfiction, of course, science, of course. I mean, art is not devoid of um, you know uh, non-fictional aspects. Um, I was a science student before I kind of got into literature. So a lot of my work has science and scientific elements in it. And uh, to me, they're just two sides of the same coin. I know in, in academic scenarios, you know, you're streamed in a way that you become anally so, so PhD oriented and uh, that, you know, you forget the rest of the thing doesn't exist, but to me, it's very important to look at things holistically, which is also one of the reasons why climate change is not being addressed because that holistic action is not taking place. You know, COP26 was a cop out. The couple of econo uh, the economists had a front page that says cop out, mm -hmm. you know, and the same leaders are going in their jet plane, emitting so much carbon, and then they're talking about, you know, uh, sustainability and so on. I mean, you know, there, there has to be some, sort of truth leveling there. Mm -hmm. uh, but science and arts are two sides of the same coin. I'll give you another example how it kind of works. When I was in college undergraduate in Delhi, and um, I think we our class was on metaphysical poetry, so we were studying Dan and so on. And if you remember the poem, um, well, not just the sun rising, busy old fool, unruly sun, but there was another poem which he looks at the cosmos and writes this poem about the cosmos. And, the teacher was extremely intelligent, erudite, gave us all the theory that should be attached to that and the historical and sociological sort of the framing of that particular period. And made a fantastic case for the background of the poem and what the poem is all about. But she forgot an essential part that the poem was written because Dunn looked through the first invented telescope yes. and his vision of the cosmos completely changed. The stars were closer, they were more be better defined. And so that's what he was talking about. So without that scientific base, base, and it's so obvious that it should first be foregrounded before you get into the fancy critical st yes. st stuff, which you guys are very good at. <laughs> but, um, but science certainly plays a huge aspect. And you know, there are two sides of the same thing. You know, it's the yin and yang, and that's the way I look at it, you know. There's, there's lots of things I, I, I want to kind of ask whether then do you think the Anthropocene, you're talking about looking through a telescope, does the Anthropocene provide a way of looking at our world afresh? And I, I'm thinking of Bani Capodeo talks about these ideas of, of poems of unsettlement, right? Yeah. That these are kind of shifty, uneasy, in-between states of being. Yeah. And 
and I think what I'm really interested in the collection is, is the way that you don't reroute something that could be very pessimistic. And, and in fact, the form of political resignation, you end up somewhere quite different, but you're still, the whole, whole collection is focused through the idea of the Anthropocene. Is there anything, you talked about it being a gift. I, I, my, I'm very, I don't want to call it that because I'm, I'm sort of so aware of how it's entrenched inequality and, and you know, the, the, the millions there, but can it reframe the materials of poetry and politics in some way that doesn't end up with political resignation? Well, it ought to. It's high time, isn't it? I mean, if we can't do the reframing now, when will we do it? I mean, the world's collapsing. One of the things that happened, you know, what, what prompted me to write this, partly this book, and what got me into climate change was something, again, something that, you know, I couldn't... So there was this, I think I was surfing channels, and it was one of those network uh, TV news. And um, I just stumbled upon an interview which was being done with the president, the president of Kiribati, the small island nation in the Pacific. And uh, the, the reporter was asking all sorts of very, very topical questions about, you know, food and healthcare and so on and so forth. And, and he was a very sort of serene looking man, very, very Buddhist looking man. And he said, you know, I can give you the statistics and answers to all these questions, but do you know that um, the highest point on our island is only six and a half feet above the Pacific? Mm -hmm. And our country will be the first country that goes under what are you going to do with all the educated people and all the people you, we have in my country? Are you going to house them? What about climate refugees and so on? And this was way, way back. Of course it's not been addressed. Why hasn't it been addressed? Because it doesn't suit the so-called um, engineered corporate political space. You know, it's about making money and uh, if you start doing this too soon, there are so many other lobbies that are going to stop it, you know. We know the facts. It's all there. It's been documented. We don't need to know more. Mm -hmm. um, the Atlantic Ocean is moving one inch every so many months inland. They say that most of the big cities will be underwater in 15 years. We know all this, but yet the real estate price in, in, in Miami has shot up in the last year. They're buying condos on the beach. So there's, a, there's a disconnect, isn't there, between what we know and what we do about it? It's a, it's a, it's a programmed, uh, unthought through disconnect. People just think, and driven by media and, uh, and agendas that you know, rule our uh, social media space and, uh, and politics, geopolitical situation, we are not allowed to, or they don't allow us to actually uh, take into cognizance that these things are happening because it doesn't suit their larger agenda of power about separation, of, about keeping borders tight, about not letting people in and profit at the end of it. It's all about profit. And I keep thinking, so in, in Cambridge, we have a very active um, extinction rebellion uh, group, which is always using um, performance art and music and things to kind of uh, draw attention to the current crisis. Um, but I keep thinking, and again, it's, about, it's partly about that emotional disconnect, right? The, the, yeah. the theoretical knowledge and the, the ingrained systematized apathy. And I, I keep thinking about that, that famous quote, you know, poetry makes nothing happen. Um, and I'm- Oh, it makes everything happen. Well, oh, uh, and does it? I mean, that, that's my kind of question. It is, it does. Let me just actually read out the last quote at the back of the book. It's bookended purposely. It's uh, a little quote from uh, a wonderful Polish poet who I admire. His name is Czeslaw uh, Milosz. And uh, I'll just read it. And it, this was written at a, in a different context, but it's so, so valid even now. It says, my generation was lost, cities too, and nations. But all this a little later. Meanwhile, in the window, a swallow. Should we open up to questions um, first, probably from, from the in-person audience and then perhaps to online?
Thank you very much. I really enjoyed all the poems you said, and I was quite interested what we said in the in introduction where um, it was mentioned that the pandemic time has resulted in a kind of people becoming aware of the climate crisis and how the system that we are working in is kind of incompatible with ongoing civilization. That isn't really how I see it. I think a small proportion of people have woken up to that. And the, mm. the vast majority are business as usual mm. um, profits and kind of covering up our eyes. And um, I think this is kind of what I'm about to say is very similar to what we were just saying, which was I read a really um, interesting article by a NASA climate scientist who said, I can't remember his first name, was Kalmus. And um, he said that we don't need more science. Um, that isn't going to change it. There's nothing more. We need to know exactly kind of what you were saying, but perhaps different uh, different stories and better storytelling may be what, what turns it. So I guess I kind of my question is, what do you think we could do as kind of combination of citizens, people, storytellers, artists to, to make that change happen? First, you have to recognize, thank you very, very much. I mean, it's, 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 it's very, you know, astute of you to sort of pick up on certain things. I think first thing is honesty. We have to just look in words and look at ourselves and tell ourselves, are we being honest? I mean, it, it's all about basic human instincts, really. If it doesn't start from within, it's not going to reach the community level, and if it doesn't reach the community level, it's not going to reach the state level and the nation and so on and so forth, because everybody is looking so inwardly. The, the level of toxicity is so high. We need more alkaline elements to sort of take the acidity out, you know. The balance has to be right. How will we change? Um, by holding hands. I mean, you know, ultimately, there's, you know, we have all the data, we have all these essays, we, we, everything's been done so meticulously before, and it's been recorded properly. We have all the information, but we don't choose to act. And the first way to act is just be compassionate. I mean, th that's hope, heed, feel. Our song in present tense is the line from that poem. And if that kind of song can be sung, and I'm not saying it, it, it should be sort of spiritually wishy-washy. It's grounded very much in science and politics in a sense. But we need to do that. I mean, look at what happened, for instance, um, with the whole vaccination scandal. Uh, we produced the largest amount of vaccination, the Serum Institute, uh, AstraZeneca, uh, Covid Shield is produced in Pune. And before I could come, come here, for the longest time I couldn't come because we were on the red list. You guys take the same vac vaccine as I take, it's produced in my country, but the British laws were such that they didn't recognize the vaccine we were taking because we were taking it in India. Of course, then the government threw up a fuss and they said, we won't allow anybody from England to come in and then of course, you know. So that's the kind of hypocrisy we are talking about, you know, I mean, and this is 2021. We're not talking about the dark ages. Uh, so you have to start openly. There's enough money in the world to feed everyone. You know, there's enough money in the world. We have enough resources to give free vaccines to everybody. Why is it not happening? Why is it kind of in a silo that it's only the booster shot is available only in America or in England, whereas certain African nations haven't even got their second shot? The answers are obvious, isn't it? I mean, what do we do? At least help your neighbor, the neighbor helps them. And dissent, get on, you know, get these guys out. The problem is the world has changed so much. It's not just my country and my leader. There's Trump sitting somewhere else. There's Putin somewhere else. There's Bolsonaro somewhere else. There's all these figures. There's something has really ogre-like changed in the sort of mechanism of, I suppose, Part of it is, you know, the civilizations die and they are reborn. We are at the end of a certain civilization crisis. So until the world is destroyed, it's not going to start anew. But I don't think that way. I mean, that's a cycle we can't control because it's part of a larger cosmic geological thing. That will happen in any, in any case. I think there's hope. I am, I'm positive, you know, because there's so much light around. The neem tree outside my house I didn't read that particular poem. Outside my house is a good metaphor. It's only humans who are angst-ridden. You know, the, the neem tree flowers, regardless of the pollution. The birds come and nest. Everything happened naturally. 
It's only us who are extremely well educated, so called advanced human species, uh, need shrink and other things to kind of get all hassled. You know, the life actually, 99% of the life in nature carries on happily and fruitfully. So we just have to be honest. Yeah. Great question. Um, do we have other questions or indeed a follow up or anything? Thank you so much. My question relates to just what you said about sil about light. And I took away from your poem that silence is white. And often we think about silence as black, as an absence. But I was quite struck when you talk about silence as white being the light, and perhaps in a world of noise, especially political noise, silence is golden but white. The reason I use that color is because uh, white includes within its whole all the seven colors, of course. But beyond the spectrum of the seven colors, what we don't see with the human eye, and that relates partly to what you were saying, is we are, as human beings, however well we are educated, you know, we are very, very limited in our scope of not only thought, but also physical things like seeing. So beyond the seven colors, of course, you have the infrared or the ultraviolet spectrum, which the human eye can't pick up. You need other things to pick up. So black is absence of light or whatever it is. But to me, white, black is not even negative for me. From the culture I come from, you know, when, we, when, we, when people die, we wear white as opposed to black because it's always hope and it's light and it's also part of the tradition. It's a old, old, uh, I mean, the older cultures have a much more evolved sense of how to treat humanity. But of course, in practice on ground, it doesn't happen that way. But white is much, much more potent as a color than say black is because black is just one little thing. White has everything in it. And it's more polyphonic, more possibilities. And the refractive index of white is much more exciting than black. Sudeep, why do you always wear black? <laughs> <laughs> I do because it's, um, well, shall I be facetious? Part of it is just laziness, you know? You know, I have six black shirts, six jeans, you know, a couple of black jackets and it's so easy to just wash them and just keep them. And, you know, it, you know, you can wear black anywhere. It's both informal and formal. Color changes. It, it'll always be my socks and this. That's where the color happens. Elsewhere too, but those are intimate details I won't tell you, sadly. <laughs> it's meant for people I let people in. But yeah, it's 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 just it's 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 just a personal thing. It's just easier. I suspect partly also as a young student when I was in New York, that was the hip color to wear. I was at Columbia University. Everybody around me in the artistic world wore black, and it just sort of carried on, you know, from there. It's just easy. It's just practical, really. Very much for coming. It's been very interesting hearing what you said. Pleasure. Um, I'm interested in the cover of your book. You seem to have three leaves on there. I'm just wondering what sort of tree they're from and um, why you chose them. Is there some significance to the to the cover? So there's a story to it, of course. I mean, there's stories to everything. Um, I was cleaning my, you know, pandemic, of course. You know, I mean, I, I've, I've, I don't have any more shelf space which goes this way. So in the rooms where I'm allowed to be untidy, my filing system is this way. You know, the books are growing in sort of different heights. So I have to jump over things. And those are the rooms which I tell nobody can come and move them because I, in my head, know exactly which paper and which book is where. Um, so I was cleaning long overdue cleanliness, had to be done. So I was you know, looking at an old book and these three leaves fell out. And then I remembered when it was, it was way, way back, many decades ago, I must put it in. But when I saw the leaves and I was looking at the leaves through the light, the sort of beautiful 
um, uh, imagery that was being cast on my hand because of the sunlight, because it was very, very filigree and it, it had hardly anything. So I decided to keep them in a way and I kind of put them in a piece of paper. And I, when I put it there, I said, oh, it looks rather nice, so I photographed it. And this, this was one of the options, you know, I sent the publishers and, you know, photography is side B of my life. So part of it is image making and um, uh, it's an Indian in tree. It's a people, people tree, leaf of a people tree. And it, just the granular structure of this leaf is so beautiful that it in partly tells you about the degradation of the world because of the frailty and the gossamer-like uh, quality of the leaf itself. But the way through time, you know, our body system and the skeletal system wane and, um, uh, and, and uh, get sort of uh, not, it's not in the pristine um, sense. But with leaves though, because it doesn't have the human ants, they retain their beauty and purity regardless of their age. So that's the other thing, you know, it was a comment on that really. But, you know, I mean, that's all sort of very academic, you know, we can write a paper on that. But really it, it was just three leaves. They were beautiful, I photographed them and it just fit the, fit the tonality of the book itself. And, Peddling uh, anti aging products that was really quite, quite useful. Um, do you have any more questions? Yes. Thank you for the poems, they were really beautiful. Um, my question is regarding the descent that you spoke about in India. And um, being an Indian myself, I know about the different things that are happening in Delhi with regards to the um, construction that's going on and everything. And you also speak about, sorry, you also speak about hope in your poems. And uh, in the last few years, especially, like I feel like it's a quite a hopeless situation in mm. India. So do you see the two things coming together or one taking over the other at some point? You know, the thing is, uh, I know exactly what you're saying and we all know about the situation, not just in India, but worldwide. And it, everything seems hopeless. But without hope, there's no other way. We can't actually wake up in the morning without hope. That's the only thing. If you're going to be just thinking about darkness and grimness and um, things that are not pleasant, there's no reason why you need to get up in the morning. So the only thing that drives us is hope. And which is why I think the the last one third of the book is, fo is focuses on that. Uh, I think there's hope. There are lots of sensitive people around. I think there's, it's just a question in the political climate where the powers that be at the moment are such that the good, so to speak, or the light or the hope part is ostensibly being covered by a kind of penumbric cataract-like uh, filter. But the light has to come through. I mean, imagine the sun, for instance. I mean, that is not going to stop giving us energy. It's a small localized thing. I know it involves our lives. And for us, lifetime is so limited that it seems overwhelming. But, you know, I feel that um, there is a lot of hope. And more importantly, you know, what, what have we as adults done to this world? Our children are inheriting a world which is not really fair and not their doing. Uh, so we need to focus on those things more than anything else. But yes, I'm very, very hopeful. Otherwise, there's just no way. There's no point, really. Maybe, maybe one, one more question, if there is one. Um, yeah, yes, we do, we do. Um, this is quite a different uh, different question, but you um, referred to imagery or symbols from multiple different religions, and I wondered if you have a relationship with any religion or religions and how that fits mm. together with your work, if you're Good willing question. to speak about it. No, I'm happy to speak about it. I have a very, very intimate relationship with religion and, and philosophical and spiritual thought. It doesn't matter which religion it is. I'm very, very uh, uh, privileged and lucky that I grew up in India. Uh, as ostensibly a Hindu, uh, it didn't matter really one way or the other, but in a real living sense, don't believe in what you read in the newspapers, but in a li real living sense, 
Um, just the, the fact that we had Muslim friends and Christian friends and Parsi friends allowed us to eat different kinds of food, celebrate many times over the same festival in different languages. The songs were different. When you, when you are growing up, you don't think about these serious things about, you know, is that particular religion saying this or that? It's just an excuse to go and have some more food and things. My mother has a prayer room. She's no more sadly. My mother has a puja room, the prayer room. And of course, she was born into a Hindu family, so ostensibly all the gods and goddesses are Hindu iconography. But she also had the, uh, the Bible, the crucifix, the Quran. And always she used to tell me that it doesn't really matter who you're worshiping because the best of any religion, all religions say exactly the same thing. It's positive, it's about humanity, it's about humanism. It's only, again, politicized religion, which kind of veer things off. And so um, because I've grown up in that kind of space, I feel very comfortable in any kind of ostensibly religious space, which is one specific thing. I just recently did a reading uh, at St. Andrew's Church uh, in Cherry Hinton, one of the oldest churches in your city. And uh, the vicar invited me, she had read the book, and it's just amazing how beautiful things like these happen. It was the Christmas carol night, and they had all these different people doing lesson one, lesson two, lesson three, and she said, why don't you do lesson seven and read some of the poems? She selected the poems. And I read these poems, which are comes from so-called Hindu person, written in Delhi, in a non-Christian space, but completely resonated with, people in the church and they are hardcore Christian believers of a certain kind and it was when that kind of connection happens you know it's okay the world is not too bad so if your wider worldview and education is such that you understand the other religions and where they come from then you don't see conflict within these things so faith is a very, very powerful thing. For me, faith is what? It's poetry. It's the light. It's music. I don't necessarily have to get up in the morning and pray to one God. I'm so thrilled and lucky to have so many gods and goddesses I can pick and choose from. It's brilliant. Or the lack thereof. If I choose not to do any of it, that's good enough too. But they're all in you. you know. It's like different red and white blood corpuscles and uh, the blood sort of, you know, depending on your body temperature, different kinds of things pop up. Right now, the Delta variant of the Omicron is the biggest God we have to deal with. But uh, no, 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 I mean, I'm completely very at home in any of these divisions you're talking about. They're not. I think we probably should draw, draw to a close. Um, Shadik, thank you so much for um, your humor your humanity and your hope, which is a great way to begin 2022 um, after a couple of years with a bit slight uh, shortage of it. So if you could thank um, Shadi for the wonderful <laughs>